In episode three, things are going great for Daphne. She's getting proposed to left and right. She's also shooting them down. And word of this has gotten a lady Whistledown who writes about it in her latest pamphlet. Whistledown hypothesizes that Daphne isn't interested in anybody else. She's just waiting for the Duke to take the plunge and ask her to marry him. They, however, go out for ice cream and are just kind of reveling in the fact that they've fooled everybody. The ruse is working. When she gets home from this ice cream extravaganza, her mom asks her, have you thought about who you want to dance with tonight? And she starts giving out a couple of names, all of them being lords. And her mom says, well, what about the Duke? But Daphne reminds her mom that the Duke hasn't proposed yet. Her mom tells her that marriage isn't exactly rocket science. You just marry the guy that seems to be your best friend. And while Daphne thinks that's ridiculous, her mom tells her, no, it's that simple. But Daphne isn't the only one who's getting ready for the ball that night. Marina is going to be making her first appearance since she became, quote, sick. Portia wants her out and married ASAP. Because in Portia's mind, she's selling off damaged goods. If she gives Marina away quickly, then when Marina has the baby, whoever marries her is going to think it's his. Penelope, though, wants things to work with Marina and the baby's father, George, who is on the front lines fighting in Spain. They keep waiting for George to write them back, and Marina's getting frustrated that she hasn't received a letter, with Penelope reminding her, you know, he's on the front lines, it might take a little bit for you to get word. But Portia rules that household, so Marina's going to the ball, although when she shows up, she is very, very rude to the first guy that Portia introduces her to, setting the tone that she's not going to follow Portia's rules just because Portia wants her to. Daphne and the Duke, though, head into the ball, and immediately she is met by a lord who asks her to dance. And the Duke plays it off perfectly, acting like he's so jealous. But Daphne dances with a few of the guys there, and none of them really do anything for her. And while Daphne is dancing with the other guys, Violet is reminding Lady Danbury that she has to get on the Duke to actually pull the trigger and propose. There is, however, a new player in town. He's a prince from Prussia. And girls are falling over themselves to get to this guy. The first one to actually approach him is Cressida. And from a distance, Daphne and the Duke are making fun of her the entire time, predicting her every move as it happens. The prince, however, is brought over by the queen to meet Daphne, with the queen introducing Daphne as the season's diamond. But when the prince says something that Daphne and the Duke had joked that he would... Daphne cracks up, embarrassing the queen completely. Doesn't really matter, though, because the prince is smitten. At this ball, eventually most of the guys get together and start gambling, and that includes the Duke and Antony. And it seems like the bad blood between Antony and the Duke is gone. The Duke tries to bring it up to him, with Antony telling him, well, you can't be mad at me for questioning your intentions, but the Duke says, no, I can. Yeah, I've done some stupid things in my life, but you know me better than anybody. You know I wouldn't make a fool of your sister. As the two are discussing the Duke's intentions, in walks a bunch of other females, including Sienna. These are basically all of the side chicks. And Antony doesn't really want to run into Sienna, but he does notice that she walks right up to the Duke and starts flirting with him heavily, inviting him to one of her concerts. Although, to the Duke's credit, he never shows up. That night, though, after the party, both Antony and Daphne can't really sleep, and they meet up in the kitchen, where Daphne asks Antony, why won't the Duke marry? Antony doesn't give her the full story, but basically tells her that he never knew his mom, and he barely knew his dad. He grew up a lot different than them. In the 20 years that Antony has known him, he's never really mentioned a family, and that's because the Duke likes to be alone. The next day, a new Lady Whistledown pamphlet comes out, highlighting that Prince Frederick from Prussia is in town looking for a wife. And Prince Frederick, along with everybody else, is going to be at this new art exhibit that's opening. And by everybody else, that includes the Bridgerton family. When they show up, Violet starts pointing out all of the single females for Antony, but he's just not interested. It doesn't take long, though, for Daphne to attract the prince. But Daphne doesn't seem really interested in him, and that's something that he seems to like. The art of the chase. She, however, prefers to leave the prince and go into another room where the Duke is admiring all the art that he and his family had donated to it. This whole room is nothing but his father's artwork. And as the two are staring at one particular painting, which the Duke tells Daphne was his mother's, Daphne starts giving her interpretation of it, and their hands start getting close and close until eventually they're actually holding hands. Although they realize what they're doing and they pull away. They go outside where there's a commotion going on, and that's because Cressida had swooned and fainted and was saved by the prince. And look, there were no Oscars back then, but if there were, Cressida wouldn't have gotten one of those. She would have gotten a Razzie because it's horrible acting. The next day, news of this has gotten a lady whistled down, and she writes about it in her latest pamphlet, highlighting the fact that Cressida has seemingly gotten most of the attention from the prince. But while most people are obsessed with him, one person who is noticeably not is Daphne Bridgerton. And news of this does not sit well with the queen, who basically instructs the prince to go court Daphne because she is the diamond of the year. 
The prince, however, is under the assumption it's a waste of time because Daphne seems to be really into the duke, and he respects that, but the queen does not. This, however, is kind of a down day for everybody in this society. There's no balls going on. So Daphne decides to spend her day working on a piano tune that she's creating, but this leads to a fight with Eloise because Eloise still does not understand Daphne and Daphne doesn't really understand Eloise. Portia Featherington, however, wanted Marina to see how the other side lives. She brings her to the slums, showing her that if she doesn't follow order, this is what she'll become. And more importantly, what her child might have to deal with. Marina tells her, I have a man who loves me, and Portia says, alright, well then where is he? And Marina tells Portia that he's fighting on the front lines for his country. She also tells her that she's written to him many times, love letters, but Portia asks, well has he written back ever since informing him that he's going to be a dad? And the answer to that is no. Portia tells her that a lot of guys will say things to get in your pants, but when it comes time to actually take care of a child, eh, things kind of change. Shout out to all the single moms out there. She then takes Marina home, but Portia knows that she needs to really get through to her. So she, along with one of the help, forge a letter from George in Spain, sending it to Marina, where George breaks up with Marina, telling her that he wants nothing to do with her whatsoever. It really breaks Marina's heart. And the most unfortunate thing is the fact that she has no idea that it's all a lie. And Portia did this because she's so convinced that this guy is never going to show up for Marina after learning that she's pregnant. She feels like this will be the best way to get Marina to buy into the season. Daphne and the Duke, however, meet up at a park and they start talking about marriage. But the more they talk about it, the more the Duke realizes that Daphne doesn't know anything. And it's not her fault, she just hasn't been told by her mother. The Duke doesn't want to exactly be the person to tell her about the birds and the bees, but Daphne begs him and eventually he gives in. And he tells her about what happens between a man and a wife, but he also tells her about, you know, alone time with yourself and your hand, a.k.a. all of high school, college, and my adulthood. And this blows Daphne's mind. She had no idea that you could take your hand and go down there and feel around a little bit, and eventually you feel feel real good. So with that planted in her head, she knows what she'll be doing that night. The Duke, however, is picked up by Lady Danbury, who chastises him for dragging his feet with the proposal. Danbury tells the Duke that it's obvious to everybody with two eyes that Prince Frederick is into Daphne. So if the Duke is truly into Daphne, that's fine. Go along with it. But if this is nothing more than just a fling, then the Duke should cut her loose. And she also tells him that if he doesn't, she'll never forgive him. But while Daphne has caught the eye of Prince Frederick, when Daphne gets some one-on-one time with her body that night, it's not Prince Frederick that she thinks about, it's the Duke. And as she's upstairs having her first orgasm, outside, her brother and sister are discussing the sexist society that they currently live in. The next day, when Daphne meets up with the Duke for ice cream, she's in a real good mood, but the Duke is not. The Duke, heeding the advice of Lady Danbury, breaks things off with Daphne, telling her that their mission is accomplished. Daphne has plenty of suitors, and the mothers are currently off the Duke. Daphne, though, can't figure out why he's doing this. She feels like she did something wrong. And the Duke, a lot like his best friend Antony, does not let her down easy, but instead is really rude about it, telling her that they were never friends. She was nothing more than a means to an end. And it upsets her so much that she runs home crying. It upsets him so much that he had to do it, that he wants to get the hell out of England ASAP, telling those that work for him to expedite the process of finalizing his father's affairs. The next day, Daphne has to head to a seamstress to get a gown. And at the same seamstress is Cressida and her mother. And Cressida's mother walks up to Violet and kind of thanks her for backing off of the prince because with Daphne out of the way, that leaves Cressida to become a princess. And it's pretty awkward because Cressida's mom admits that while Cressida has the money, Daphne has that face. But the whole conversation can be heard by Daphne. And with just being recently broken up, sort of. Daphne now has revenge in her mind. So she tells the help to prepare that bad bitch gown. That one that's going to get everybody's attention at the ball that night. Now Violet goes to check in on Antony to see if he's going to the ball. And in fact he is. So she hands him a list of potential females that he should be looking at. But he's not interested in any of them. In fact, after seeing Sienna, he went back to the opera to try to apologize and win her back. But she told him no. Completely rebuffing his advances. So he's really not in the best mood. But Violet is completely unaware of this. What she is aware of is the fact that Antony doesn't have a lot of time. Now, another female who's looking to be on the revenge tour is Marina, who thinks that her baby's father had just up and dumped her. So when she arrives at the ball that day, she's willing to dance with just about anybody. The Duke has also arrived at the ball, but he alerts Lady Danbury that he's going to be leaving England immediately. And because of this, Danbury calls him a fool. And he looks even more foolish when Daphne shows up. Because the gown, the ball, everything works. The entire party stops for her. And when she makes it downstairs, the prince leaves Cressida's side 
and tells Daphne, I must be your first dance, and she accepts. And as the two are dancing, the Duke can't watch anymore. He just leaves. And in the next whistle-down pamphlet, she wonders if this was simply Daphne sick of waiting for a proposal from the Duke or Daphne leveling up because a prince is better than a duke. Thanks for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to this channel. Like the video if you liked it. Hit thumbs down if you don't. Be nice in the comments section. Nasty comments hurt my feelings. I work hard on these. If I make a mistake, it happens. If you don't see the next video up in the end screen, it'll be up soon. Sharing is caring. Put it on your MySpace page or your away message. And check out my podcast, Scene Invaders, wherever you listen to podcasts.